Good evening, and welcome to Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary's live stream event, COVID-19, Fear, Facts, and Faith. Tonight's topic is In God We Trust, Faith and Economics in the Season to Come. My name is Professor Ken Barnes, and I'll be your host for this evening. As we do with all things at Gordon Conwell, we'd like to begin this evening's proceedings with a word of prayer. Would you please join me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks tonight for the wonders of technology, allowing us to reach across the globe to discuss a topic that has gripped the world with fear, fear of the known and fear of the unknown, fear of the present and fear of the future. But Lord, we are reminded that perfect love casts out all fear and that you've not only foreseen the future, you have secured it for us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the ultimate act of love. And so we pray, Lord, now that you would open up our hearts and our minds. We pray, Lord, that you would give us faith, hope, and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let me briefly describe the format for this evening. After introducing our two esteemed panel guests, comprised of two world-renowned economists who are both also followers of Jesus Christ, I'll begin the evening by asking a series of questions relating to the unprecedented economic impact of the COVID-19 virus, not only here in the West, but around the world. Our panel will share their insights with us in turn, and then we'll open the floor, as it were, to questions from you, our viewers. You may send us your questions electronically through the Facebook Live site. We hope you'll find this evening to be both useful and inspiring. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our two esteemed colleagues, Dr. Robert A. Goff Jr., who is CEO of the predictive analytics firm Chatham Hill, and a senior lecturer in economics at the University of New Hampshire. Dr. Goff has been a strategic advisor to national governments, central banks, multinational corporations around the world. And he works at the forefront of artificial intelligence, big data, and strategic decision-making. It's also my joy to welcome Dr. Sarah Lawrence Menard, who is the CEO of Mannerin LLC, she is also an adjunct professor of practice in social finance at Babson College. Sarah has not only taught social entrepreneurship and sustainable development at Northeastern University and Columbia University, but she also has firsthand experience as well, having served in the Peace Corps and having served as a socioeconomist at OECD, where she has designed and implemented programs for private investment and natural resource management across 18 West African countries. It is indeed my honor to welcome both of you to the panel. So without further ado, I'd like to start with this question for you, Robert. We've all seen the headlines recently, 26 million unemployment applications in a month, extreme volatility and decline in the markets, negative oil prices, two and a half trillion dollars in fiscal stimulus from the government and another six trillion dollars in a combination of quantitative easing and direct business loans from the Federal Reserve, which they've never done ever before. Yet there are people who think that when this is over, the economy will somehow shrug this all off and we'll get back to normal. So I have a two part question for you, Robert. Do you agree? that the economy will bounce back quickly? And what exactly will normal look like? The answer to the first question, Ken, is uh, no and absolutely no. Uh, the economy will not bounce back quickly. And there's two reasons for that. One is the virus, and two is the economy itself. We have to keep in mind and recognize that even though we're hearing a, a few more positive pieces of news about the virus, the logic chain begins with the virus, 
It's the virus that drives the economy. Uh, economics does not have the tools to be able to tell us when and to what intensity a rebound will occur because that's virus determined. Uh, what a, a president or a governor is not going to tell us it's time to go back to work. Uh, the, the economy is open and things will, will, will start to get better. People will decide that. Uh, if you take a look at, uh, at for example, uh, some recent data uh, that uh, came out of uh, Johns Hopkins uh, as of uh, a couple of days ago, you can see worldwide that this, the, uh, the, this virus took off, uh, skyrocketed in nonlinear fashion in the month of March. But just in the last uh, week to 10 days, you can see it has topped off. Uh, and it has done the same thing uh, in the United States. It has topped off. But that doesn't mean that we are out of the woods. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, things are going to return to normal anytime quickly. That's just good news. It means that the behavior patterns that we have been practicing over the last uh, three to four weeks are working. So, but th so the virus is determining uh, the conditions. Now, what happened in the economy during this time frame? Well, one thing that happened is the stock market plummeted uh, not only to the, de to the deepest uh, extent that it ever has, but also the most quickest extent. Uh, in the first 23 trading days uh, from the last market peak, the market fell 34%. But then it rebounded uh, the, um, uh, quite quickly over the next 12 to 13 days to the point now where uh, uh, we're, we're experiencing a tremendous amount of volatility uh, in the market. Now, I'm, uh, I'm, all right, now we're back. Sorry. Uh, now, the, the economy um, is going to open up when people decide it's going to open up. The, it's almost analogous to a space capsule coming, uh, coming back into uh, uh, the, the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, if the space capsule, we, we're, going to, we're going to change from a stay-at-home economy to a re-entry economy before we, uh, we, we, uh, any, any kind of major uh, increase in, in economic activity takes place. So the re-entry is going to have to be carefully calibrated. If that space capsule hits the atmosphere too directly, too quickly, it burns up. If it's a too cautious re-entry, it bounces off the atmosphere and uh, goes out into space never to be retrieved, meaning businesses, in, the, in this case, the analogy, businesses in the economy would have to be rebuilt. So consequently, it's a fine line that we're going to have to walk uh, in this period, this re-entry period, over the next few months. Uh, so it's not going to be quick, it's not going to be easy, and it's going to, de it's going to depend a lot on whether or not uh, uh, people maintain the protocols and the behavior patterns that we've seen uh, over the next several months. Uh, the governor of Georgia today said that he was going to reopen Georgia. A lot of people think that's too soon. Uh, I happen to agree with that. Uh, the, the, the governor isn't going to reopen Georgia. The citizens of Georgia will decide whether or not the state is going to reopen, and that's going to be true uh, uh, throughout the country. Uh, I think we should point out the fact that we've had two experiences with major events in this century that have interrupted economic activity. Uh, the first one was in 2001, it was 9-11. And that caused the economy to become intertwined with terrorism. But that was solved by our understanding uh, through defense intelligence and geopolitical political relations to get the economy back on track. The second event was in 2008, when world capital markets nearly collapsed. But that, but that was a, a result of understanding what was causing that. Uh, bad financial instruments uh, like subprime mortgages, credit default swaps, um, and excess of spending. Uh, so, but that was solved. This time, we have a commingling of the economy with biological, medical, and healthcare issues, not all of which are understood. That means, therefore, that the economy is not going to be able to rebound 
anywhere near as quickly as it did in the early 2000s or in 2009, 2010. Well, let me ask you this then, if I may, and, and thank you for that fantastic analogy. You know, having grown up during the moon uh, shot experience, I remember seeing on television the explanation of, of the angles of reentry and how finite they were and how important it was to get that right. That was a fantastic analogy. Thank you. Um, and that's going to be critical this time, Ken. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. Uh, I, but I'm very concerned about not just the immediate, but the slightly medium term and long term impact of all of the tools that are being used to try to keep the thing going in the meantime. As, as you know, in, in, in my book, Redeeming Capitalism, I expressed a deep concern about debt in America, mm -hmm. government debt, corporate debt, household debt, all of them were at pre-global financial crisis levels before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now we have all of this quantitative easing, all of this government spending, something in the order of $8 trillion in a month. After 2009, it was 10 years to spend that kind of money nearly. So I have another two-part question for you. Have we in the West been living beyond our means? And are the current practices sustainable? Well, the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, we've been living way beyond our means for a while. And the fact that debt is looming. In fact, uh, we're going to have the virus. We'll solve that virus at some particular point. But the next big problem is debt. And you asked me a question a minute ago uh, in your two-part question, which I don't think I answered, uh, that, that uh, dovetails nicely into this uh, reality about debt. And it's because of debt and because of the, uh, the reentry uh, uh, protocols are going to be very different that what we're going to see on the other side, in the medium term, you called it, uh, is nothing akin to the, norm the, the normative uh, uh, types of uh, behavior, behaviors, jobs, and, and economic activity that we've seen prior to this. We're going to see a new normal. Uh, and there's going to be, a, a, and there's going to be, a, and, the, and the debt's going to, uh, to define this to some extent. First and foremost, uh, I thought about this uh, over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks since we, uh, we were together. First of all, capitalism is going to be redefined. Uh, there is no doubt about that. Uh, uh, the, the, the virus has, has, has caused us to recognize uh, uh, the frailties and to recognize what needs to be done. The country is moving to the left. Um, if the government, if people want the government to protect us on the downside, then you, you can bet there are going to be new rules and new regulations on the upside. Another reality is the fact that low interest rates are going to be with us for a long time, uh, the, the, which means, th therefore, that there are some signs uh, in the economy that are troubling uh, as to why uh, interest rates cannot rise. Because if they did right now, they'd cut off any kind of, uh, of recovery. Uh, uh, at all. Demand will come back very, very slowly. Uh, equity is going to replace capital because liquidity is going to be short. Uh, things like stock buybacks, they're going to be over because, and that's a good sign. Uh, the company is going to have to get, uh, the company is going to have to get uh, uh, creative uh, in order to, uh, uh, to be competitive. What's fair value? Uh, that's, that, that's a question that's going to have to be determined. Multiples are going to be much, much higher. But we can't just do business better. We have to do business. We're going to be doing business differently. Um, I think I've mentioned before that uh, and I, uh, I've told groups that uh, if all you're doing right now in your business is to improve that which you do, then all you're doing is preparing to fail, because things are going to be really well uh, are going to be really defined differently uh, as we knew, as we move forward. There is going to be no V rebound. Uh, at best, it's going to be like, a, like the Nike uh, swish. The uh, uh, competitors, uh, the, the, real, the, the most efficient businesses are going to have fewer competitors. The Walmarts, the Amazons, the Costcos, uh, the Targets, the Home Depots, the Lowe's. Uh, those, are the those are the big, successful, highly, run, uh, highly efficiently run companies right now. What's going to be washed out are the inefficient businesses, some inefficient small businesses some inefficient medium-sized businesses. Now, to some extent, that is good. 
but that that is not going to mean we're going to be going back to normal. We're going to be going back to uh, uh, a new normal, which is go is which is going to involve all, all all those parameters that I just mentioned, as well as a seismic shift to digital to di to, to digital activity. But uh, if you want to see some uh, uh, interesting things about the uh, uh, how the uh, uh, the debt situation is going to uh, uh, affect us, that would be helpful. Take a look at. Uh, uh, at, uh, at this particular chart. Here's the, uh, here's the debt as a fraction of gross domestic product since the 1960s. We are now up above 100% of, uh, of, of our overall economy, uh, which is the first time that has ever happened uh, just in the last uh, uh, several years. Here's what it looks like on a 100-year basis, uh, talking about living ab above our means. And here's where we are right now in terms of the dilemma we face. This is America's debt path uh, since World War II. Uh, and, and when we, we, we now are around 2020, uh, we're got, this thing's gonna skyrocket because of those numbers that you just uh, mentioned, Ken. And where it goes beyond that is, uh, is anybody's guess right now. But the trajectory of the debt that was projected in the, tw in the 2020 uh, federal budget deficit uh, is not gonna be the same. It's gonna be much, much higher because of the uh, because of the numbers that uh, that uh, that uh, you just cited, Ken, yeah. and and debt is going to be the next time bomb that we are going to have to uh, uh, deal with because we're already spending prior prior to the stimulus, we're spending uh, about a half a trillion dollars to service that debt, interest cost, uh, and you add on top of that the numbers that you just mentioned, uh, and the interest cost is going to skyrocket. And when we hear from Sarah in a minute, she's going to tell us all the wonderful programs that we could have with that kind of money. Uh, between 500, and 500 billion and a trillion dollars is going to be going out the door over the next several years just to service the debt. Think of the programs that, uh, that could be put in place and funded and maintained with that kind of money. So let me ask you this then, because you know, the Bible has an awful lot to say about debt and usury and honest dealings and fiscal and social responsibility. As a Christian economist, um, what do you think Christians can and should be doing firstly to change the narrative? Because that's a big part of getting people to change their behavior. And then ultimately to change behavior. Because let's face it, politicians will respond to what people want. And I'm not sure we want all the right things. What can Christians be doing to change that narrative? Well, um, one thing, broadly speaking, we need to rethink how we live. Uh, we need to rethink and we need to reboot. Uh, we need to stop thinking that uh, things will be taken care of, uh, think, think we will be taken care of uh, by another entity. Uh, namely government. Uh, the real focus is, uh, I think, is what can we do? When the, uh, I think you make me think of the parable of the talents. Um, and when the two, uh, the two gentlemen that were given um, uh, stewardship uh, over uh, two talents and five talents, they went out and, uh, and doubled those talents. Neither one of them, no, we don't know how they did that. But I'd be willing to bet that neither one of them went to work in a job and simply saved more. Uh, they became creative. They had to have been, been very, very innovative uh, and, uh, and smart about how they used that, uh, those assets that were given uh, them to, uh, uh, to improve. Uh, say, uh, it, but, uh, what, and what concerns me is what about, what about the person with the one talent? Why did he, why did he not have uh, the confidence or the ability uh, to do what the other two gentlemen did. Uh, is, is, it, uh, is it that uh, Ken Robinson, the, uh, the, uh, the well-known educator from England, is he right that our educational system is educating kids out of creativity? Uh, uh, what can we do? Uh, I'm very interested in that one gentleman who didn't do anything with his talent. What can we do to help those people? Uh, because, uh, and, 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 and as Christians, 
we have a responsibility uh, to, uh, to provide uh, and to go to work uh, and, uh, and not to expect things to be given to us. And the two talents became four, the, the five talents became 10. Uh, that, those weren't done by simply saving money from a new job. Those had to have been done by creative, innovative thinking. So let me, let me ask you this, in, in terms of the big moral question here, you, you said capitalism is going to have to be reinvented, the term I use is redeemed. Um, but there must be a moral impetus here, because I'm a grandfather. I'm concerned about the fact that my grandchildren are going to have to pay off this huge amount of debt. Uh, I'm concerned that we are leaving them with a world that's been damaged um, ecologically uh, by runaway economic activity in many areas. I'm concerned uh, that we haven't been prudent, uh, that we hadn't, haven't been temperate. Um, is there a place in the narrative for prudence, for, for temperance, oh. for thrift? Why aren't we talking about that in our churches? Because it seems to me like the church has drunk the, the cultural Kool-Aid of, hey, borrow, 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 live high off the hog, and don't worry about who pays for it. Your grandchildren, Ken, are not going to pay off the debt. And the reason they're not going to pay off the debt is they can't pay off the debt. It's too big. Uh, I mentioned the last time we met that uh, Joshua spent a million dollars a day since the walls of Jericho all the way up till the present time. He would have only spent 5% of our current uh, debt levels, uh, which gives you an idea as to the enormity of that current debt. There's no one generation that can pay off this debt. There, we, we do not have the ability to pay off this debt, but that doesn't mean uh, we need to shrug our shoulders and be cavalier about the fact that it just exists and continue to live the way we do. Uh, we need to change how we do things and substitute how, for how to, what if. You know, what if we change our mindset? What if we change the way we were doing things differently, at least to stop the leakage uh, and to stop the, uh, uh, the, the debt from getting so high, to start paying it off uh, and to start doing things uh, that will perhaps absolve that debt, forgiveness, I mean, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the festivals uh, of Jubilee and the, and, the, and the times of forgiveness that we read about in scripture. Uh, is there some of that debt that can be forgiven, you know, in a practical way? Uh, because it's not possible to pay that off. In the, in, in, you're not going to pay that off in two generations. Well, that's, you make a fantastic point. And, and I want to thank you for that insight. And it's also a great segue into our other guest, um, Professor Menard. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar based on your work with a lot of the calls for Jubilee for some of the international debt burden that um, developing countries have been uh, laboring with for a very long time. We've had a lot of reports coming out uh, just in the last week uh, from the IMF, from the World Health Organization. And the one thing that is unequivocal is that in the United States, uh, COVID-19, that pandemic has disproportionately affected communities of color in terms of physical health and economic health. I saw uh, uh, something today that said 50% of African-Americans are unemployed uh, as a result of loss of work in the service economies and they can't work from home the way perhaps you and I can work from home. Also in the global South and in other emerging economies, there seems to be a disproportionate impact on those people. So my two part question to you is, why do you think it is so that people of color in this country and the global South generally is being more hurt by the pandemic and what do you think should be done to address that inequality? Thanks, yeah. So it's not news, of course, to African-Americans in the United States that their life chances are diminished by racism in all its forms and functions. Um, black folks are poorer, more likely to be underemployed and living in substandard housing. 
uh, given inferior health care and financial services because of their race. African Americans are 60% more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes than white Americans. Um, black women, 60% more likely to have high blood pressure than white women. So what public health experts call the social determinants of health can include things like mass incarceration, huge influence and effect, negative effect on African American communities, housing discrimination. The Boston Fed did a really important study recently showing the uh, household wealth of African Americans, $8 compared to $100,000 of white Americans. That's real empirical economic reality that translates into what we call um, social determinants of health, but of course, you know, it's all connected. So the failure to see and to act to counter systemic racism when disasters strike like COVID-19, whether they're natural or man-made, make these vulnerabilities amplified and intensified. And what we're seeing now is really alarming. Uh, Louisiana has 21,000 reported cases, and yet while African Americans only account for 33% of the population, they account for 75% of deaths. Mississippi and Georgia are worse. The situation is alarming in both rural areas like Albany, Georgia, which up to 81% of deaths from COVID are African-Americans and urban cities like Chicago, where African-Americans account for 52% of the city's cases and 72% of deaths. So in an economy like ours, which has experienced a record shattering run of the bull market, the most basic necessities we're seeing, food, shelter, and medical care are all suddenly at risk for everyone um, it evokes what Nobel laureate Joe Stiglitz often says, the invisible hand is invisible because it doesn't exist. Uh, we should have been ready for a global health crisis, but we're not. It also invokes what Michael Sandel's important book, What Money Can't Buy, talks about, which is that we've allowed money to dictate our morality, including assuming that rising tides will lift all boats in the face of systemic racism. So as Christians, we know there are moral limits to markets, and I see this crisis as really ripping a Band-Aid off so we can see what the wound looks like. We currently have a grand total of 22 million jobs, roughly the, the net number of jobs created in a nine and a half year stretch that ended with the pandemic's arrival that are gone. And as Robert pointed out, the numbers climbing. Um, will they come back? Will some, maybe some will, but, but there'll be serious financial harm being done in the meantime. And that harm is disproportionately affecting communities of color, income poor folks and immigrants. Let me give you another example that really struck me in the heart. Uh, there was a, a headline in the BBC, coronavirus at Smithfield pork plant, the untold story of America's biggest outbreak. Uh, it's a really fantastic uh, illustration of excellent journalism. I'll actually include the link in the Facebook um, page for Gordon Conwell so folks can look into it. But it describes how the largest pork producer in the country is keeping workers on the job without protective gear and when they do get sick, denying them income protection. So of course, low income folks of color and immigrants keep working. What is sad is we have this automatic reaction when we hear stories like this, that low skill workers are lucky to have a job. Um, they should be compensated for the extra time they're working, but you know, it's their choice to work. Just one of hundreds of examples where black and brown brothers and sisters with families and dreams like all Americans are economically forced to work in companies like Smithfield for pennies, contracting the virus at higher rates. And because of their income or immigration status, they're seen as disposable and they're not provided the same social protections as white folks. So this is the wound. And this is the US labor market in an economy that's you know, increasingly dehumanizing and unsustainable. And it's economic evidence, it's not ideological positioning that this crisis has revealed profound longstanding vulnerabilities in the economic system. And because everybody feels them, they become real. So for some, maybe for the first time, um, you know, they're feeling this and certainly in very different ways for communities of color in America, but a lot of the things that they're experiencing are just amplifications of things that are um, part of their existence. So I would say the lack of resilience from what we're seeing as a very high risk, high debt market logic and the dangerous social determinants of health for folks of color that really affect financial and health, health outcomes are just two sides of the same coin. So that's the US side. And on the developing country side, I'd say that in addition to extremely high levels of indebtedness, as we know, and weak governance structures, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia, um, they're certain to be hit a lot harder as Robert explained, um, which is, you know, 
because we are in the worst downturn since the Great Depression. So when really low income countries are exporters of commodities used by industries where factories are being shut down around the world, it means there's less demand for those commodities and prices fall sharply in some cases. And what this means um, in real terms is, you know, no bread, no rice uh, for families. Um, so in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, copper and zinc are key export commodities and these prices have, have fallen. Um, and it hits businesses and government revenues in really significant ways. Healthcare systems are overtaxed in a pandemic um, and, and in the international community has to come in and support them. So, uh, you know, denying millions of dollars, for example, to the WHO is, is an evil thing to do at a time when these organizations are actually needed more than ever. So what's needed in these countries, particularly right now, is, uh, you know, debt relief for HIPAA countries, high, highly indebted poor countries. Uh, reinforcing health infrastructure, technology sharing, but I would say one of the biggest pieces are open borders and international cooperation. Because if we don't get medical care and expertise to a lot of these um, sub-Saharan African countries particularly, uh, you're gonna see what we see in Kenya, which is, um, you know, this translates into food shortages and into a lot of other um, health problems. Wow, that was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, you know, a lot of the things you're talking about, it would seem to me, uh, will involve the proper role of government, the proper role of NGOs, the proper role of the private sector. These are complex issues. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are a lot of very interesting debates going on. And I think they're reasonable debates mm -hmm. about uh, where government should start and stop, where the private sector should start and stop, where uh, NGOs should start and stop. And, and that debate will go on for a long time. But for our purposes, I wanted to ask you also a two-part question. Uh, as a believer, what do you think the church should do? What role should the church play in addressing these systemic issues as well as the pastoral issues? And what can individual Christians do to help mm -hmm. level the playing field and also love our neighbors as ourselves? That's a, that's a, a complex question. Take it in any bite you want. And if you need me to repeat any of it, I will. Thanks. You know, I think reasonable, pe reasonable people can agree that in a public health crisis, it's precisely the time when government intervention is required. Um, you know, COVID, no one's to blame for COVID. Everyone is untouchable. Um, everyone is, is touchable. No one is untouchable. And um, there are also times when the private sector is expected to rally and to support wherever it can. Some companies have done amazing things, have pivoted in admirable ways. Um, the values-driven business, businesses, the uh, companies that are, you know, B Corps, et cetera, um, pivot a little bit more easily, right? Patagonia, REI, um, even Airbnb. Uh, they, they're pretty quick to jump into a sharing economy and to find ways to support people without looking at the bottom line. But we've also seen surprising private sector um, adaptations, for example, with AT&T, right, providing healthcare workers three months of free telephone coverage, um, Johnson & Johnson making masks. And so it's wonderful to see what the private sector really should be doing without having to be asked, um, because I think we are in a wartime uh, environment. Um, what matters to me is the outcomes that people in the margins are feeling? How are we treating the weakest in society? So the question of who's responsible is, is, um, is less important than really who's protecting and caring for them. Um, and the problem is, is when we get into these broad strokes of all companies and all government, it's all hands on deck, right? And that's really where I think um, where, the, where the debate can be helpful. So what can the church do? Uh, a lot, frankly. Um, and I, I really think that, uh, you know, one, one thing that comes to my mind is, you know, if faith isn't about healing of every kind, then what is it about? Um, and so one of the questions that, that comes to mind for me is, you know, not only what, what is the church's role, but maybe what should the role be? Or if we add a design thinking spin to it, what might churches do? Um, so when I think about the church and its role in addressing issues exposed by the pandemic, I honestly can't help but worry a little bit because the church across all denominations has been in a tough spot before COVID-19, right? Church closings by the hundreds in some states, congregations having to decide, do we stay open? Do we close? What's the most responsible way to steward these assets? Um, how do we still serve our community when, uh, you know, when we can't, um, you know, 
have keep our building. Um, there's a real crisis in the church um, in this country, right? And so COVID has exacerbated a lot of that. Um, and those feelings are, are shared across denominations. But churches are also doing some pretty terrific things right now, right? They are, um, they're supporting with mutual aid societies um, and providing food and immigration uh, advice, pro bono law, law advice for immigrants, um, providing spaces for homeless, um, creating blood banks like my church here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so really stepping up a lot of churches in different ways, responding to their communities as best that they can, which I think is wonderful. Um, and I think there are really powerful examples where churches role in opening up economic opportunities and turning fear into flourishing is happening. I'm really privileged to help curate some content right now for a nationwide gathering called Faith and Finance, Reimagining God's Economy. And we're bringing together folks uh, to share their experiences and strategies. People like Parish Collective, it's a global movement of Christians reimagining what it means to be a church in and with for the neighborhood. Um, another one is Wesley Community Development, helping North Carolina churches develop and repurpose real estate to meet church and community needs. And uh, along those lines in Asheville, a um, woman named Amy Cantrell has started something called Beloved Asheville, uh, community organizing around assets and, and economic opportunity. And then over in San Antonio, one of the poorest zip codes in the country, there's Ram Gonzalez with uh, Urban Lazarus Partners or Sydney Williams in Crossing Capital, New Jersey. Sydney's done an amazing job connecting black churches with um, impact investing strategies to, to harness market forces. And then last but not least, I'll just mention, you know, folks like Patrick Duggan, who manages United Church of Christ's Church Building and Loan Fund. They've been doing this work for 166 years, responding to really difficult ways of how does the church insert itself in low income communities and become a force for good. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that that, that Patrick says in the church building loan fund is half of the population of the United States is poor or low income. And yet Americans are condi conditioned to believe that poverty is an inj injudicious choice by people who have ample opportunity to prosper. So the role of the church is to highlight the wound, is to highlight the illusion that somehow um, there is a rising tide and all boats are lifted. Um, it's also to really get deep into the question of money. The challenge for many churches come down to two pocket thinking around faith and money. If you dig down a couple levels of why, you will always get to money. And so I just, I, I think one of the most important things that Christians can do right now is um, to ask some really tough questions. Um, who do you think you are compared to your neighbor? Who do you think God is in this crisis? What do you expect from God? What does God expect from you? What do you expect from your life? How much is enough? Where is your surplus? Who, who is my neighbor? And what do I think money is good for, right? Um, can you write really beautifully in Redeeming Capitalism that money doesn't have a value in itself, right? Um, people only use money because they agree or have faith that it does. Um, it can cause misery and euphoria. Um, and this notion that, you know, scarcity is a fundamental component to money. Um, as Christians, you know, this is not our natural disposition. Um, neither in the Bible nor in economics. Eleanor Ostrom's empirical work on collective action versus prisoner's dilemma. You know, she just highlighted the obvious. We don't live in prison. We live in a natural world. Um, and so our predisposition is to cooperate. I think there's lots of exciting things that churches can do and Christians can do. And I just particularly want to shout out to this brilliant book by Walter Brueggemann called Sabbath as Resistance, where he talks about mindfulness in a market society that is increasingly mindless. So if there's anything we can do now as Christians and in churches is to be awake, is to actually look at things, is to be able to look at the wound and understand what it is and that it hurts all of us, whether it's racism that's systemic and it's all the effects of COVID that are disproportionately affecting folks, but it's also the silence of a church and a mindless congregation that is um, sometimes crippled by fear. Uh, and so how do we turn that fear into flourishing? And a lot of it is... Um, just really taking the time to be thoughtful and mindful and recognize the gift that we have in front of us. Fantastic. I have one last question for you, and then we're going to get to the questions that are coming. We've got some really interesting questions coming from people who are watching, and I want to thank people and encourage people to keep sending them. We can't get to all of them, but we'll try to uh, make composites out of some of them. 
so referring back to a question I asked Professor Goff, um, if you could wave a magic wand, as it were, uh, and uh, figure out what the new normal should look like, what would the new normal look like for you in this reconstructed, redeemed, reformed, changed capitalism that we're talking about, especially as it relates to those underserved communities? Yeah, um, I'm going to turn the question a little bit on to you by just saying that I think the most important thing to do is let the communities of color define what their new normal should look like, right? And I think, and so that's really where um, our next move is as a community of Christians is to say, um, where are white people uh, stepping up where they should step back? Where are folks of color and communities of color's voices not being heard? How do we craft and shape an economy that's both inclusive, equitable, sustainable, and also creative and flourishing and innovative by understanding that there are um, so many incredible entrepreneurs and ideas in communities of color that have not actually been heard or have access to finance, have access to power or decision-making. So, um, we need to stop defining normal through the lens of uh, of a uh, you know white Christian male, <laughs> and we need to um, we need to really use COVID as an opportunity to deeply reflect on that and to really say in what way has that paradigm actually created um, you know the, the 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 real harm that we're experiencing now as a community um, and as a society and as an economy. Wonderful. Thank you both. Uh, really insightful uh, responses to those questions. And they weren't easy questions. Uh, I know because I wrote them. Uh, and I really appreciate what both of you had to say. I want to um, sort of follow up actually on something that you alluded to a minute ago, Sarah. You spoke about the prisoner's dilemma. That, of course, is uh, a thought experiment that we use in ethics. And as someone who teaches ethics, um, I find that uh, that kind of exercise very helpful, uh, if not infuriating at times. But someone has asked a very, very good question here about weighing in the balance uh, these various potential outcomes. On the one hand, we have a disease, which if we hadn't done the things we've done, the social distancing, the shelter in place orders, the shutting down of the economy, Etc., would have almost certainly caused hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of deaths in this country. We've all seen the charts. The president has shown us the charts. Uh, uh, Dr. Fauci has shown us the charts. And yet, on the other hand, we know that a sustained economic downturn will also have life and death consequences. So, what do we do? How do we find that balance between? the burden of knowledge that doing nothing will cost tremendous life and doing certain things for too long could cost tremendous life. How do we do that? How do we balance that as Christians and as economists? Robert, I'll start with you if you would. And then uh, Sarah, if you would uh, chime in and I may say a word or two myself. Robert? Well, let me start by just saying that uh, uh, I'm really pleased that the discussion uh, that we're beginning to have now in the last several days around the country and in policy circles is now focusing on how to get the economy back to work and what kind of policies do we need to, to assist in that manner. So the fact that the, that the policy discussion, discussions about policy and asking many people what they think they sh should happen is a good one. But I think we have to be careful uh, about how we assist. Um, and there was, a, there was an interesting book several years ago by an African uh, woman who got her uh, PhD from Oxford. Uh, and the, and the, it, the book was entitled Dead Aid. And the author's name was, was Moyo. And in the book, she said to the West, please stop giving us so much money. She said, help us. Don't just give us money because all you're doing is, is enabling us to continue dependency. I was talking to uh, a, a US Senator uh, not too long ago, 
and he was talking to me about the fact that our uh, our subsidy programs and our assistance programs in this country were fabulous. And what doesn't doesn't this show what a great country we are? What a great system we have to be able to do so much help to give people so much help uh, uh, through subsidies and aid in various forms. It just shows what you know what this what the, how strong the economy is. And I said to him, sir. In all due respect, I think you've got it backwards. I said, if we are giving out so much aid, that raises the question, uh, how do we define a successful system? I think a, a successful system must be defined by the amount of aid that we don't have to give out uh, compared to what we do give out. Uh, because if we have to give out a lot of aid, the system isn't working. And so consequently, what we need to do is to think about how we can help people uh, to, uh, to learn new ways of doing business, uh, to, to, to learn new ways of helping themselves. Uh, the, uh, um, so the, the subsidy programs in this country are wonderful for times like this, and I support them tremendously, but they can't they continue to uh, be at this level. And we can't continue to think that people just need more money. And I tell groups, I tell students, and I tell senior executives of large corporations, it's not always about resources, it's about resourcefulness. Uh, and the same, thing, the same thing can be applied to churches. Uh, there are many churches who have, though, that are very well funded and can have uh, uh, wonderful programs uh, that require a great deal of capital. But there's a lot of things that we can do without, without a lot of money. And, that, uh, and so a lot of churches can, uh, uh, can, can, can reach out uh, in ways other than just providing money to those who need it. Excellent. Sarah, anything you'd like to add to that? I think you're on mute, Sarah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think, you know, one thing to recognize here is that, as I said earlier, you know, money in and of itself has no meaning or, or value. We, we decide what value it has. The problem is the things that we actually do value, um, we, don't, we don't account for. Um, family, sun, air, water, relationships. Um, and these require a level of um, protection and honoring and gratitude and reciprocity. And, I, and, and so, you know, in an effort to um, continue a paradigm that's, that's, you know, solely looking at growth through a very poor metric called GDP, um, we will continue to undervalue the things that actually hold us together. So the next step will be to um, really understand and, and for the first time what a post-GDP uh, economic uh, thought project could look like. Um, there's a lot of work that's done on this already. Joe Stiglitz, Fatusi, and Amartya Sen did this um, already. Um, and so there's a lot of work done. And so it's, it's political will ultimately, um, but it's also a mindset shift um, to just convince folks that we have been holding on to a system based on faulty uh, theories around human behavior, which are ultimately incredibly pessimistic and completely unbiblical. The idea that people are inherently self-interest is a highly pessimistic view of humanity. So we need to change our view of humanity, which is changing our view of economic theory, which is changing our mindsets and models and learning how to uh, price things accurately and understand the moral limits of money. And to do that, we need to you know, both start small because church communities and mutual aid societies is where this stuff gets evidenced. Like I just mentioned in those other great examples of folks doing this all over the country. But it also, of course, requires um, federal policy um, and, you know, international cooperation, um, because you know we're not we're not an island as much as some folks want to think. Um, we are a global community, and so um, where you know one border is closed, it has huge imp impacts on other folks. So yeah, I'm excited to see what comes out of the next uh, several months in terms of creativity um, around economic thinking. And I do think that if we can hold on to the empathy and the compassion that we feel with what this COVID virus has elicited in the human imagination, um, and we can translate that into, you know, real brave, courageous action um, around economic change. 
Thank you. And can let, I, let me, can I, yes, yes, go ahead, please. Can Robert, I just, uh, uh, Sarah brought up an interesting phrase uh, just now, and that is we need to be able to price things accurately. Uh, and that's correct. And the only way that things can be priced accurately is through a free market. Um, what's happening right now in terms of, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning of our discussion, um, uh, Ken, is uh, about, um, uh, about this, this, uh, this general area uh, is that uh, the Federal Reserve, oh, you, you, you talked about uh, how much money was get, being pumped into the economy right now, uh, upwards of $6 trillion or more. The Federal Reserve has announced that it is willing to participate in the financial markets to whatever extent is necessary to keep it stable. And what they're going to do initially is basically to partic participate in the high yield bonds, junk bonds, uh, to basically stabilize those prices. Now, that may be a good thing, but it's not a long run good thing because it's a slippery slope, uh, not just to have a government, but to have a central bank participate uh, in the free market. Because one of the hallmarks of capitalism is that you and I need to be able to go out and pay a price for whatever asset we're buying or considering buying that we consider to be fair. And what is a fair price? And that's legitimate and been determined by mass vetting uh, or a free market. If a, if, an, if, a, if a government entity is playing in those markets to shore up the price of, of bonds, what's gonna happen? It's gonna scare away investors because they're gonna know that the price of those bonds are, is artificial. Uh, and so they're not gonna be there, which, which, which then gets us into a vicious circle of the Federal Reserve having to stay there and to continue to participate in the market. So I have no problems with, uh, with government involvement uh, in, in, uh, in situations like this, but we, we have to be very careful in terms of how we calibrate you know, this re-entry uh, into the atmosphere, in, into a new normal uh, of having a role for government uh, at, at, at particular times, but not as a continued player to the extent that we're going to have it right now. I agree with both of you, although I, I do want to say that we, we uh, need to remember that every economic decision is a moral choice as well. And, and that's what I think the, the questioner was asking. We, we have a situation right now where um, everything is, is being read through the prism of a utilitarian ethic. People want to measure on a risk reward calculus uh, you know, what, what the value of one life is versus the value of another life. And the problem with utilitarian thinking is that in theory, it works out okay. You say you're gonna make a decision that has the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people until you realize that the people who are left out of that equation are you or someone you love. And that's why utilitarian ethics is actually an incredibly blunt instrument and usually very, very inefficient when coming to true moral ethical issues like a global pandemic and a global economic crisis. That's when we have to start thinking about uh, deontological ethics and virtue ethics. Uh, what is it really that we want mm -hmm. from our medical community and our medical experts? What is it that we really want from the World Health Organization? What is it we really want from our governments? What is it we really want from the Federal Reserve Bank and its involvement in the economy, as you say? Because it's very easy to print money. Uh, it's much more difficult to get it off your balance sheet afterward. And we know what the effect of that will be. So to those people who are asking questions about why can't we just open things up and let the chips fall where they may, and yes, people are gonna die, but that's life in the big city. Um, that is not a Christian ethic. Let me just make it very clear uh, that, that you know, John Stuart Mill and, and others who, 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 who advocate for that kind of thing had a particular worldview that you cannot by any stretch of the imagination call a biblical worldview. So we have to be very careful in this conversation that we remember one of the reasons why we're asking everybody to make huge sacrifices is because we value life. We value the life of the people who will die if we don't do these things. 
So we are all burdened with the burden of knowledge because the science is quite precise in its modeling here. And so I just want to say to people who would like to see a quick, easy fix to this, let's just get things back to normal. Let's just flick a switch and go back to work. That's not an option. It, it, if we were to do that, the human cost would be so great that we would be dehumanized, I believe, and our Christian voice would be neutralized forever. These are, these are very delicate ethical issues here. Uh, and that's why I encourage people uh, to in involve themselves in discussions like this. And frankly, to think more deeply about ethics, about mm -hmm. virtue, about what it is we value. Because at the end of the day, if we reduce everything to its least common denominator, which is a pleasure pain calculus, we will keep doing these things, Robert, that you and I are talking about. We're just going to keep printing money. We're just going to keep running up the debts. We're just going to keep the band playing on the Titanic while the ship goes down. And that's a really dangerous place to be. That's well, my let's tenet. Yes. Let's ask the, uh, let, let's consider the unemployment uh, insurance uh, program. Uh, when people uh, lose their jobs and they get unemployment assistance, which is a good thing, by the way. Uh, I'm pleased with it, but there are uh, some people that need, need it uh, more so than others. And some people are collecting an amount that uh, they really don't need, but they, but they are truly unemployed. Uh, but what happens, for example, when a governor says, it's time to go back to work, so we can all go back to work. And if you choose not to go back to work, you're not eligible uh, for unemployment insurance anymore. Uh, so if the state is open, if a company is open, and it says, okay, you can come back to work and you choose not to go back to work. Your unemployment insurance is you can't collect it anymore. Now there's a moral implication of that because uh, is the government gonna tell us when it's time to go back to work? We are gonna tell us ourselves when it's time to go back to work. People are not gonna go back to work until they're comfortable and until they're confident. Absolutely. And, and, and the poorest but, people will be at the greatest risk. We all know that. We know what's going to happen if governments open up their states too quickly. The poorest, most vulnerable people are going to be the ones who have to go back to work, and they're the ones who are going to get sick and die. Yes. And as Christians, we cannot allow that mm -hmm. to be an ethic that's acceptable in our society, in my humble opinion. Sarah, I, would you like to chime in? I would, and I think one area where, where the church can play an interesting role is... Um, you know, business, private sector companies right now have an incredible opportunity to be the, the best in class, to provide employment opportunities that are um, humanizing, that are, you know, rewarding, that are just salaries that are clear and, and just, work environments that are safe, um, social protections for families that are, you know, fair. Um, and so, you know, the church might have a role here to play in just saying, is there a social license to operate? Um, it, you know, do we actually have a role to play to say, these companies um, are, you know, places where we want our congregants to go to, um, to understand that there is a marketplace in every church because the congregants are workers, are entrepreneurs, are business owners. Um, so I just think there's a wonderful opportunity here to break the walls down between Sunday and Monday, church and marketplace, and really talk about what types of businesses um, do we want people to go back to? Just like you said, people want to go back to work. Work is dignified. Work is an important thing. You should assume that everyone wants dignified work, but we have to provide dignified work. And what does that actually look like? And if anything, from this COVID virus um, situation that we've experienced, which is we look, we know pretty clearly what dignified work does not look like. And so, so let's make sure that we highlight that and we um, provide incentives, um, both financial ones and social ones to companies that are doing the right thing. Wonderful. I have uh, more questions uh, from the people uh, who are sending them in and they're fantastic questions. Um, one of them hits a little bit home for us. Uh, it, it's a question about uh, a certain segment of the population which self-identifies as evangelical um, has in some ways distrusted science, including the dismal science of economics. 
Uh, and this lack of trust is causing people to be very skeptical and is likely to lead people to believe that they can take risks that are far more dangerous than they realize. Perhaps one of you or both of you would like to address this unfortunate situation where people don't want to trust the experts, as it were. Well, you want me to start, Sarah? Sure, go ahead. Um, I'll be the first one, and I think I alluded to it uh, in my early remarks, is that economics does not have the answers to tell you when the economy is going to turn up and to what degree it's going to turn up, uh, because the virus is driving the logic chain. The second point that Sarah is, uh, if, I can, if I can collapse what she's saying into, uh, into one broad statement, the economy is, is not just about numbers and data. It's about people, uh, and people decide. Uh, uh, but, but I'm concerned about good policies that are in place that uh, may be not effective if, in fact, a policy is if, if a decision is made to go back to work. So I'm, not, I'm the first one to, uh, to be uh, uh, humbled uh, uh, about, uh, about my own discipline. Uh, that uh, when, when I say I don't, when, when someone says I don't trust the experts, I don't trust the economists. Well, if you hear an economist saying today, now, that the economy is going to turn up in, uh, in a V fashion in the fourth quarter, the truth of the matter is he or she doesn't know. Uh, that's based upon an assumption. And so consequently, economists cannot tell you when to go back to work. Uh, that's going to be determined by your degree of comfort in the medical community as to whether or not they have a vaccine about to be ready uh, and whether or not the therapeutics are there to mitigate the impact if you do catch the virus. Hmm. I just Sarah? say on the public health front that, you know, God has given us an incredible uh, scientific mind to um, study, discover, um, celebrate creation and all of its systems and interlocking systems and phenomenological, you know, unbelievable things we discover every single second, right, in science. Um, the fact that some folks don't uh, um, recognize uh, scientific knowledge um, is unfortunately not just their problem, right? Um, it's everybody's problem. It's the same debate we had with, uh, with inoculations and, you know, vaccines. So I think that that's really where um, public health workers, uh, in some ways, to me, are, you know, the sort of the the front frontline ministry, um, because what you're doing is actually helping people understand that um, we are our neighbor's keeper, we are our brothers and our sisters' keeper, and by taking care of yourself um, and understanding, you know, the virus, understanding what happens. Um, you're protecting other folks. And so just recognizing that, you know, to, to look with a blind eye to scientific information um, in this world where we're so interconnected um, is it's not, a, it's not a luxury and it's not a right. It's actually really dangerous um, and incredibly selfish. You know, we see that in what happened in Louisiana during the, um, the, the, the statistics for COVID in Louisiana right now, right? And in Florida. So yeah, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real problem. Let me, let me just ask you this. You know, the title of this session is called In God We Trust with a question mark. Uh, we all know that that was uh, put on money uh, at the time of the Civil War because people had lost faith. They had lost faith in institutions. They had lost faith in the concept of a federal government. They had lost faith in the banking system. They had lost faith in the greenback. So um, President Lincoln had In God We Trust put on the money as kind of a rally cry. Uh, and, and I suppose it, it, it served a purpose because it's been on money ever since. But I've said to many people during this crisis, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the central banks and the governments are making it up as they go along right now. We're, we're in uncharted territory. Uh, and, and that is just a fact. So as Christians, how do we take all this in and how do we trust God when it comes to economics? How do we trust God 
in the midst of this pandemic? And I'll open that up to either or both of you, and then I'll ask you one last closing thought. How do we trust God, Robert? Well, we trust God by trust. We uh, we trust God by trusting God, uh, because if we believe in God, if we love the Lord, um, then we believe His Word. And in His Sermon on the Mount, He says, "You know where you know where your uh, uh, treasure is, there too will be your heart." Mm -hmm. um, and so, consequently, we have to ask ourselves. You know, uh, I don't know the answer to a lot of these things. Uh, so I would agree with the person who asked the question about not trusting the experts, but we do our best. Uh, and, and in the final analysis, um, prayer is my answer, uh, to ask the Lord, you know, for direction, for wisdom, for guidance. Uh, we, can, we can run all the models we want, uh, but we can't come up with an accurate prediction. Uh, one thing I learned years ago when someone told me, uh, and I'd spent uh, you know years in graduate school uh, learning how to uh, to engage in economic uh, economics, build models, and someone told me that I was trying to be very careful with the models I built. They said you, you're spending too much time on that because uh, you're never going to be right. And they said that's not the goal of forecast. And I remember thinking, as a young economist, why did I just spend six years in graduate school? when someone tells me that I, I, I'm, I'm never gonna be right. So, and he said, the, the real purpose, the, the real goal of forecasting is to minimize the impact of being wrong, uh, to try to narrow the variance. That's what we try to do because it's not an exact science. And in this particular case, you know, I am commingled, if you will, uh, with the biological and medical experts. Mm -hmm. And so I have to rely upon them to tell me when is likely uh, or to what extent, you know, is, is it a vaccine or is it a therapeutic? A therapeutic is simply gonna mitigate it in the meantime. Uh, and so then I can be more accurate once I have better answers from the medical community. But I, I wouldn't be comfortable going back to work right now. Uh, but if, we, if someone has to go back to work, then we have to see to it that protocols are enforced uh, and people uh, hopefully through a moral inner compass, uh, will engage in, uh, in the use of protective equipment and, and, and appropriate social behavior to continue to mitigate, to conti continue to minimize the risk uh, of this virus. Excellent. Sarah? How do yeah. we trust God in the midst of this economic crisis and pandemic? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the most important things we can do right now is recognize that um, it's hard and that to have overwhelming doubts and worries around God and faith and where is God in all of this. And N.T. writes, you know, wonderful piece he put out about don't ask Christianity to explain this. Um, it won't. Um, I think it's important for everyone, um, re regardless of your faith traditions, but as Christians, particularly, I would just say, um, you know, rest in the fact that you can have incredibly deep faith and love God with all of your heart and also have lots of doubts and questions and that mm -hmm. it's completely healthy as a Christian to have those types of thoughts right now because it is a really overwhelming time. And I think that um, spending time recognizing that we don't have the answers um, and that the suffering of others is, is you know, um, is hard to bear but um, it's through Christ's suffering that, you know, we feel his love. And so recognizing that we, that God shows up in suffering um, is a place that we can hold on to and trust it with our hearts and just say, you know, this is a really important time where the suffering of our brothers and sisters all over the planet and next door neighbors, folks that we didn't even know live next to us. This is an opportunity um, to really feel with them um, in really deep ways. And so I think it's an invitation to be deeply mindful and reflective, um, to slow down. I think one of the things that's really important about this, this you know, stay at home uh, time period is um, in our everyday lives in a market economy that you know, trades trillions of things in a nanosecond, um, it's so exciting to know that we actually can slow down. And I do think that um, God shows us when we slow down um, what his economy looks like 
um, because we actually take the time to look at the lives uh, of the people that are the weakest of these, right? The, the poor, the marginalized in the economy for the first time um, in a really deeply humanizing way. And I think when we do that, um, you know, we see God in a different way in a really important, beautiful way. Um, and so I think that's the invitation that we have right now as Christians is to um, ask tough questions. Don't, don't shy away from them. Um, don't put away the, you know, obvious things that there is an ecological crisis and an, a financial one and a social one that's all interconnected. Um, and sort of rest in the fact that we have um, deep faith that um, God is in control. So the things that we can't control, um, we have to recognize, um, you know, it was an illusion that we ever thought we did. Um, and so what does it mean when we actually give that up and, and, and try to recreate an economy that is, um, you know, really reflective of the gifts that we have and the things that we value? Mm -hmm. That's excellent. And, and I would say that the way we trust God in this situation is to emulate God's love mm -hmm. because God is love. And if we put love uh, at the forefront of all of our ethical decisions, if we put love at the forefront of all of our economic decisions, our political decisions, our social decisions, our church decisions, we can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. We can't go wrong because that's what God asks of us. He doesn't actually require us to always get it right, mm -hmm. but he does always require our hearts to be right. Mm -hmm. So in this very strange era, I want to ask you all to just give our audience the one last thought mm -hmm. that you'd like to leave with them tonight. And Robert, I'll start with you and give the last thought to Sarah. Uh, and uh, before you do that, I just want to thank you both for a wonderful conversation, stimulating, wide-ranging, uh, but incredibly interesting, and I hope hopeful and useful uh, and encouraging to our audience. So Robert, what's the last thought you wanna leave with people tonight? Well, I'll use the word trust. You use the word love, which I agree with. And I, I'll add to that the word trust, you know, trust in the Lord. He told us he'll always be with us and he won't, and he, he won't abandon us. Uh, makes me think of uh, Nehemiah. You know, Nehemiah didn't go to report to a job. Uh, Nehemiah had a vision, and then he had a plan. He got a letter of uh, safe passage, and then when, and then he had to uh, had to allocate certain people to uh, to be uh, to, to to guard. You know, so it wasn't easy, but he trusted the Lord uh, that uh, throughout that entire uh, uh, amazing project that he had. So I would say to people, uh, trust and think, but also. Uh, trust what you can do with God's help, uh, because this is a time for rethinking because of the fact that we're going to have to reboot, uh, reboot to a new normal. Uh, so trust, tr trust in what you can do uh, in this situation, and also think about how you can do that, how you can engage in the post-COVID-19 world uh, to, make a better, to make a better economic environment you, for yourself, your family your community uh, in this country. <laughs> wonderful. I, I think I'll just end with um, this wonderful piece in um, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove wrote a book called God's Economy. And in it, he talks about the parable in Luke 16 about the mid-level manager who reduces the debt of all the debtors and uh, the master, instead of rebuking uh, the manager, actually uh, commends him because it makes the master well-liked in the village. Um, and, and Jesus in, in Luke 16, 8 says, for the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. And it's interesting. And I think as, as Wilson Hardgrove says, Jesus wants us, uses this story to make us think. Um, and I think, you know, we often talk in economics about the master's tools. Um, and, you know, how can we use the master's tools to reveal the emptiness of the system that we're living in? Are we all so enamored with the ways and means of this economy that we must accept the assumptions of the system? And I think that's really where we are. So it's a bold challenge that Jesus puts in front of us. And I think um, he's given us the, the, the heart equipped to, to respond to it. We just have to let things be revealed, trust, and um, 
and just forge ahead. That's right. And I'm glad you used that passage. It's one of the most misunderstood passages, I think, in all of Scripture. And I tell my students, Jesus is not condoning what this person did. Jesus is being ironic and asking the question, because the next thing Jesus says is, if you do as the world does, you will spend eternity with them, meaning not eternity with God. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful passage of scripture. Thank you for sharing it. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you both so much. Uh, I, I really uh, can't say enough about what you've done tonight. Those of you who are watching either live or the recorded version, on behalf of Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, the Mockler Center, and our partner, the Public Square Forum in these, uh, in these evenings, I'd like to thank all of you for being part of this important event. We hope you found it useful. We hope you found it inspiring. We also hope that you'll stay in touch uh, because there's going to be more of these. In fact, uh, next week, precedent for that sort of thing. So we hope you can join us. For more information on the seminary, please follow the links that you'll find on your screen. And lastly, I'd like to encourage you to consider taking a course at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. You don't have to be a matriculated student. You don't have to be full-time. You can do it online. You can do it in person. You can do it even as an auditor. We strive at Gordon Conwell to be a thoughtful, loving, Christ-centered community of global discipleship. And you can take courses on ethics. You can take courses on business ethics. You can take courses on exegesis and church history and get a better understanding of how the church has dealt with issues like this for two millennia. We hope you'll come be part of the kingdom work we're doing at Gordon-Conwell. In the meantime, God bless you all. Good night and thank you.